For more than a year, the family of Miami native Steven Sotloff didn't know whether he was alive or dead. That is, until a troubling video surfaced showing him at the hands of the same Islamic radical militants who brutally executed American journalist James Foley minutes earlier. We never had proof of life. Unfortunately, now we see this, uh, this video. What a horrific uh, organization this ISIS is. Stephen went to UCF. He, his family lives here in South Florida. It's an absolute tragedy. Local politicians have been working with Sotloff's family in silence to find and free him since he disappeared from Syria while working. In the video, ISIS beheads Foley, demanding the U.S. stop airstrikes on Iraq. You then see Sotloff down on his knees, his captive telling the president, quote, the life of this American citizen, Obama, depends on your next decision. It is, of course, an act of cowardice. The taking and holding of hostages for money, a cause, or just because someone wants to prove they can do it. This act of terrorism came home to America recently with the beheading of American journalist James Foley. Now there is a second American who may face the same fate at the hands of ISIS thugs and cowards. It is difficult to imagine what they have gone through until you ask someone who has been in those shoes before. Welcome back to Midpoint. Middle East analyst, blogger for Huffington Post, former prisoner of war, freedom fighter, award-winning documentary filmmaker, Matthew Van Dyke. Matthew, thanks so much for being here today. Thanks for having me on again, Ed. Matthew, I hate to be blunt up front, but you have been through this before. You have been a POW in the Middle East. You know what these people do. You know what they're capable of. You know how they act in private. Steven Sotloff is a 31-year-old freelance journalist who right now is still captive. We are seeing his picture. The family is hearing about what may or may not happen. Do you think that Steven Sotloff will come home alive? I certainly hope so. I, I'm not going to give up faith that he'll come home alive. I mean, he's a good friend of mine. We actually had dinner just a few weeks before he went to Syria. Uh, I have to keep hope. Knowing what you know about the terrorists and those people in the Middle East, what would be your best assumption and your best detailing of what is going on now and what they are doing and how they are doing it. Give us an idea. Uh, uh, they're holding him. He's probably fully aware of, of the situation and what his fate might be. You know, the question is, why have they waited uh, a week now? U.S. airstrikes have continued. I'm not sure there could be negotiations going on behind the scenes or if they're planning this for some anniversary. Terrorists like to do events on anniversaries that have significance. So it's really a mystery right now why we haven't heard anything else from them. What is their thinking when it comes down to ransom? Because certainly America has said many times before, we will not deal in ransom. I'm going to follow that up, of course, with another situation that has happened recently. But let's talk about monetary here. They know it's not going to happen. So why do they continue to press the issue simply because they can? Well, ISIS has ransomed back European hostages for anywhere from 3 to $5 million apiece, generally. They do know that British and American hostages are not very useful for ransoms, that Britain and America have said repeatedly they don't pay ransoms. But they want to maintain the hostages for situations like this. They're trying to influence U.S. policy. They're trying to essentially use Stephen Sotloff as a human shield to try to dissuade America from continued bombing against them. And uh, it's not going to work. Matt, what is your best guess? I guess guess is always bad in situations like this, but your best opinion with regard to the Bo Bergdahl swap and how that may or may not have emboldened the terrorists knowing that there was a ransom of some sort paid? Well, that certainly has emboldened them. They want to hold these hostages for prisoner exchanges. If one of their leaders is captured, they've also included in some of their demands the United States the release of other prisoners related to uh, the global war on terrorism. It's certainly an asset that they want to keep. You know, you can just imagine if the U.S. were to sweep in and snatch one of their commanders that they would probably be willing to trade Sotlaw for another hostage for that man's release. Do you think that the airstrikes had something to do with it, or would this maybe have been in their plans from the very beginning? I think they were holding the American hostages, feeling that airstrikes were inevitable. Um, and so uh, the, their use of these American hostages was also inevitable. The timing of it, you know, if, if the American airstrikes had been five years from now, Foley may have been in custody another five years before he was used. 
I want to show the viewers here in the words of Didier Francois. He's a French journalist, former hostage. He said this last week about James Foley. He was an absolutely extraordinary guy, an excellent journalist, curious, curious about people, interested in people. That's why he had decided to cover the war and to go and see for himself what was going on and to try to report as closely as possible with a lot of heart. He was an excellent cellmate in detention because he was very caring. He was brave. He had great courage. What can you add? We have heard so many things here in the last week or so about James Foley, but what can you add about your personal experiences with him? All of that's absolutely true. He was a real professional, but even more importantly, he was one of the kindest people I ever knew. Um, he held a fundraiser for an ambulance for a, for a civilian hospital in Aleppo. People were being brought in by taxi cabs and in wheelbarrows, and he saw the situation, and rather than just do a story on it, he held a fundraiser and bought them an ambulance. He, um, wherever he went, people loved him. When I showed up in Syria to, to work on my film, Not Anymore, Story of Revolution, Syrians were coming up to me asking if I knew James Foley. He was a tough act to follow. He was universally liked by the people he covered and by his colleagues, by his friends. At the memorial service for him yesterday, a thousand people showed up. So it's, it's a tragic loss of a great human being. Here's something else that uh, just came to light recently. James Foley wrote to his family while in captivity, but his letters were always confiscated. He dictated a letter to a hostage about to be released. That hostage committed the letter to memory and called James' family to recite the letter. And here's just a small piece of it, which I thought was very telling. I know you are thinking of me and praying for me, and I am so thankful. I feel you all, especially when I pray. I pray for you to stay strong and to believe. I really feel I can touch you even in this darkness when I pray. You were captured by Muammar Gaddafi's forces. You spent about six months as a prisoner of war before escaping from prison. You went back to combat. When you hear those words, you were in those, not that cell, but certainly cells like that, held like that. How tough does it get after a certain amount of time to continue to have the will to want to go on? You know, prayer certainly sustains one through times like that. I mean, you. Uh you know, they, they say you get religion real quick in prison, um, and it's absolutely true. And, and James comes from a family of faith already. Uh, basically, you feel like you have a one-on-one -on -one connection with God, and that's the only way you're going to get out of that situation. I completely understand how, how James was feeling. Did you ever lose faith and ever once think about taking your own life to end it? I did. I, I made a belt out of yarn from my blanket that I also made sure it was strong enough to use as a noose if I needed to. I hid a plastic bag from the guards that my prison uniform had come in. Um, I certainly considered it, but, but I never, obviously never went through with it. But it was something that, that I ran through my mind quite a few times, wondering if I could continue to exist in that cell for 20 or 30 years, or wondering if one night they might come and rip my fingernails out during a torture and how much of it I could take. But fortunately, I was not tortured, and eventually I was able to escape prison with other prisoners which is actually soon after that is when I first met James Foley. The other gentleman involved here, a 31-year-old freelance journalist, Stephen Sotloff. We've seen some pictures and heard about him as well. You knew Stephen as well? Yes, like I said, we had dinner uh, just shortly before he left. We used to talk about Syria frequently, about security in Syria. He was also a very, very good journalist um, and a very nice person. You know, this is, this is part of the tragedy of this that something like this could happen to, to two guys that were just stand-up guys, great people, uh, and, and not only journalists who were very professional, but also people who cared about their work and cared about the people they were covering. Should the U.S. or someone buckle and pay a ransom to get them home? In the case of ISIS, since ISIS is funded by various sources that are not only ransoms, ISIS maintains oil wells. They sell oil to the Syrian regime and to smugglers. They levy taxes on areas that they control. Their funding isn't dependent on ransom demands. So in this case, it may be appropriate to pay some ransoms, but that should certainly be coupled with a policy of expanding the target list so whatever they buy with it uh, ends up just getting destroyed. Um, the end result is we need to just destroy ISIS. So funneling ransom money to them in the meantime, if that's what you have to do to save Americans' lives, as long as you blow up whatever they buy with that money, I think it's a, a policy that needs to be examined. I only got about 30 seconds left. Would you agree with those who have said on this show in many places before, things like, as far as ISIS is concerned, kill them all and let God sort them out? Essentially, yes. ISIS can't 
be negotiated with long term. They're not going to stop what they're doing. They believe that they have established an Islamic state. And the only way to deal with them is to teach them otherwise in the harshest way possible. Matthew Van Dyke, I have a feeling that if you could, you'd probably go back, pick up a gun, and get it all started again and do your bit. I don't think that's really much of a doubt at all. I thank you for your time, your comments as well. I look forward to speaking to you again. Thank you. All right. Later on this hour, a disaster facing American business and fast food. That's when we talk to the money master. And after the break, smart gun technology, firing up pointed conversations about effectiveness and potential changes to American gun laws. That's all coming up right here, where we question everything on Midpoint.